Well, uh, welcome to this uh, evening's lecture. Uh, so I'm Imit Yilmaz, I'm in the faculty and uh, coordinator of the planning program. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Jack Crowley. Uh, he's, um, Jack has an outstanding accomplishment in private sector and uh, in academia. Uh, first, he had been development in, uh, in private sector for most of his life in the United States and Central and South America. In military officer in 1960s, uh, Jack administrate, uh, administrated uh, t training programs for military officers from all over the world. Now he is advising and mentoring students and faculty from all over the world, including me uh, and Rosanna. Uh, he directed uh, Tulsa Metropolitan Area Planning Commission in, in late 1970s. As a senior real estate development executive whose team built 2.5 billion in uh, projects all over the United States in 1980s. Directed uh, the Oklahoma Department of Transportation in early 90, uh, 1990s. He was the dean of our college at UGA from 1996 to 2006. Founded the graduate planning and design program and coordinated until 2017. Please join me in welcoming my dear colleague and a good friend, Dr. Jack. You can kick, you can kick the bottom of the slide up. I, I don't, I got it. Uh, and I'll add a little bit onto that uh, because there's two people in the room. Uh, I came here pretty much out of college to teach landscape architecture in 1974 to 78 when Bob Nichols, who's sitting in the center of the room, the guy with the white hair that you can't see his face, he was the dean. And, uh, and he's embarrassed because he hired me. <laughs> and uh, another person sitting in the room was a graduate student, Marianne Kramer. Where's Marianne? So, you can see how young she looks, you can see how old I look. Been around qu for quite some time, and when you look at studying, uh, celebrating 50 years here, I think I was, well, we started in 1969, I got here in 74, so on and off, uh, I've been around way too long, according to Sonia, anyways. Uh, basically, I had the privilege of working, I started as a dean, and I'll tell you a very, very quick story, and you'll see pictures of it later. Um, I was asked by one of our contributors when I was the dean, would, they do, would I do them a favor? It was Rob Fowler, who was a banker, owned the Main Street banks, and we, I was trying to hit on him to give us a lot of money. And of course, what do you say to somebody who's a donor, or pr prospective donor, when they ask you to do them a favor? Hell yeah. He bought me a ticket to Honduras. They had a problem down there. Uh, the, the people that were cutting stone by hand couldn't cut fast enough for the architects to build the buildings they were putting up on the campus. And you'll see the campus has a very distinct building material. And uh, so I got to the quarry and through an interpreter, I inter interviewed these people in bare feet with rebar that, and you'll see a, a blacksmith in one of the slides, with rebar that's been flattened so they can chip the stone while they're hanging <coughs> off of a cliff with ropes around their waist until the stone falls off the cliff, shatters on the ground. And then they go down and they chop it up into these beautiful building blocks that we use. And I'm standing there and saying, well, they don't produce, well, it's, it's easy to see. There's five of them. Their sons are learning how to do it. It's extremely sustainable because they're chipping by hand out of stone that's only two kilometers off the campus that the campus is being built with. And so I'm standing there talking to them, and I said, what happens when you finally, finally, slowly get the pile big enough for the, the building? The architects wanted to go to stucco, and the alumni of the university there said, hell no. We've got to stay with the stone. That's our stone. It's like telling the University of Georgia they can't use red brick anymore, and, or brick and tan, or whatever we're doing here. So I'm standing there, and uh, the president of the U university is standing behind me, and I'm, the architects are standing over here knowing that I'm not going to solve the problem. And uh, I said, what happens when you're finished? Well, we go home. We'll go home meaning what? We have no job. And so I said, what if you stayed here and kept cutting stone and keeping it in piles, and when the pile gets big enough, that's when we would schedule the construction of a building? And uh, that's rocket scientist in Honduras. 
And from that day on, I walked on water down there. And that was, they kept calling me back to help solve other problems. But it was that minimal, not a problem, it was just a misunderstanding of, of an opportunity. And as a result, I was, I was just immediately in love with that university when I got there. It's just incredibly, catch on, it's a catch on, you can't avoid it. And so for the last 17 years, I've been landing at the second shortest commercial runway in the world, uh, 50, over 50 times. And that's the riskiest thing you can do in Honduras, is land at Tonkatin and Te Tegucigalpa. I learned how to spell the capital, and I am, have been for 17 years involved, and I'm uh, presently uh, Secretary of the board of, Governing Board of Trustees of the university and the Chairman of Building and Grounds. The neat thing is, you have an idea of how to build something, you draw a picture of it, things that we learn how to do here, and guess, guess what, within a year they build it. And a lot of the funding comes from foundations, uh, a lot of the funding comes from the USAID, which is getting a little skimpy given the, given the progressive nature of the present administration in Washington. Uh, they're cutting a lot of this foreign aid back because these people are just evil people that are trying to get into our country. So the best thing you can do is just you know, not contribute anything to make it more desperate for them to get into the country. Well, the bottom line is this is a cool place. And I think I'm depending on, uh, I'm depending on Lynn to run some of the more sophisticated technology. This is just to give you a feel of the place, just three minutes long. Even before the sun rises, students at Zamorano University are preparing for another day of academic challenges and hard work in the field. The inspiring story of over 10,000 acres dedicated to teaching and learning in the American tropics has been shining as a beacon of hope in Latin America for more than 75 years. Active and restless, these students learn to value a job well done. At Zamorano, students learn that a strong work ethic makes all the difference in life. They learn to love and appreciate the land as they discover its secrets in the field. They learn the scientific fundamentals of environmental conservation, agricultural production, food science technology, and responsible agribusiness and entrepreneurship. They are being nurtured as the guardians of our planet's sustainability. As the sun peaks over the mountains surrounding this valley, agriculture comes to life. Grains, vegetables, and fruit are cultivated, harvested, and prepared for market. Through 44 learning by doing modules, rigorous coursework, and a disciplined commitment to teamwork and excellence, young women and men are transformed into enterprising professionals. Zamorano graduates are recognized throughout Latin America for their leadership, initiative, and contributions to socioeconomic development. By constantly challenging our students for four years, 11 months each year, six days a week, Zamorano has cultivated leadership in generations of farm producers who lead by example. Their immersion in constant innovation and the culmination of their studies with a research thesis prepares them for the scientific challenges and opportunities of daily life. By living on campus and sharing this multicultural experience with students and faculty from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds of 23 nationalities, Zamorano graduates return to their own countries and communities with the confidence and awareness of knowledge, caring, and inspired global citizens. The sun will continue to rise over the mountains surrounding this valley, and Zamorano will continue to transform Latin American youth into successful entrepreneurs and leaders of change, innovation, and progress. Every Zamorano graduate forms a part of this beacon of hope. The next step we're going to do, and they're, when they're graduates, when they may become graduates, think about it. They're in, for 11 semesters for a, an undergraduate degree, 11 months a year for four years. Incredibly well-educated. 
They spend about four to five hours in out doing things, learning by doing, which we call experiential learning it's because it sounds more sophisticated. But when they graduate, they're called Zamoranos. And they're hired immediately because they are really quite spectacular and they go back to their own country. You notice they were in uniform. It's to kind of blend the idea that some are indigenous, uh, not even speaking Spanish, from Peru, uh, in northern parts of Guatemala. And uh, they have to learn Spanish, and then the idea is to learn English well enough to become a graduate student in the United States. And a lot of them come here. The, the, the department chair of the Agriculture Ec Economics Department here at UGA uh, is a Zamorano graduate. And so they're, they're all over the place. They have an incredible reputation. It's an incredible education that they get. So, uh, so we're going we're gonna to Google our way there so you can understand where it is. That's the earth, in case anybody noticed. <laughs> it's still blue, although the, it, the photograph was taken maybe four or five decades ago. Can you go a little bit, a little bit larger? Well, we can, we can go right, the next step down. Basically, the students are all coming from, whoop, the students are all coming from uh, Central America, the Caribbean basin, and the northern part of South America, mostly Venezuela, Colombia, uh, not so much Brazil. We have a few students from Brazil, Ecuador, Peru, uh, that's, and sometimes Argentina, Chile, but generally speaking, the northern part of South America, all throughout the uh, Mexico and the, the entire Central American, uh, the isthmus here, the peninsula, and then the Caribbean basin. We have Haitian students. We have a lot of foundations that are trying to invest in Haiti and finding out they lose their money when it goes there. They send it to us. We give Haitian scholarships with the obligation that they go back for the four years that they got the scholarship. They go back to Haiti to contribute to their country. That's an obligation they get for the scholarship. The foundation knows where the money goes. That clip, incidentally, which hopefully brings tears to the funder's eyes, was shown just last week at Coca-Cola <laughs> when we're down there begging for large sums of money. Honduras is obviously right in here. And it's kind of cool because you understand that the Caribbean is the North Shore, and the Pacific is the South Shore. It's the only country in South America that doesn't have active volcanoes. The volcano, volcanic line comes across the coast out of El Salvador and Guatemala, comes outside the edge of Honduras, and then lands into uh, Nicaragua. So the, all the countries in South America have active volcanoes for, for whatever that's worth. But the stone that we cut is actually a volcanic ash that's been compressed over thousands of years. Let's go down another, Tegucigalpa, you can see the pattern of the city right there, center of the, that's the airport at Tonkatine, which is a fine place to land. These are the, uh, the states or the provinces uh, of the place. Uh, the university is within Francisco Morazan, and you can see it's located about 35 to 40 kilometers over a very interesting mountain with roads that tend to fall down periodically. And the Japanese actually are now re-engineering that road and building it as part of their international aid. And they're doing it right. So we expect a night, and this is the, the, uh, the border with Nicaragua. So it's not that far away. And this is uh, Salvador. Okay, let's go zoom in a little more. It's in, the, it's in the municipality of San Antonio de Oriente, which has a number of villages, Ecarito, El Ecarito, the, the gourd, the village just outside the campus where a lot of the staff employees live. The faculty and most, a lot of the other staff live on the campus. Um, it's a matter of security. But uh, you can see the villages in the valley. This is now a close-up of the campus. This is the Pan American Highway. CA-6, it goes from Tegucigalpa to Managua. Back when we were founded in 1942 by the United Fruit Company, Chiquita Bananas, we were the Banana Republic. They were probably training managers for the plantations at the time, although they claimed they didn't. As a matter of fact, they claimed they did not even hire graduates of it, but it, maybe it was a give back for all the stuff they took away. Uh, they're not there anymore, but the United Fruit Company founded it. Uh, Wilson Popano was the first faculty member to come there and build the, the campus. It was laid out with quite a bit of logic. But in those days, Pan American Highway was just a little dirt road. And it was kind of cool to have the dirt road go through the campus because that's the best way you can get to the campus. But the dirt road gets bigger and bigger. 
and there's a mountain range in this direction. This is Santa Inez, which you'll see in a few minutes. This is uh, Yayuca up in this direction. So the trucks have been wind the trucks that are no longer legal on US roads that are down there are coming across the mountain and they're going slow and they're just weaving and dodging all sorts of potholes and things falling down. They're coming down the hill right here. This is a, the big run. And they can go like a bat out of hell before they get to the next windy windy on the way to Managua. And so they go way too fast. They jack break, which is that bap, 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 bap when they're coming down the hill and you can't hear yourself thinking. And so it's quite dangerous and we actually have tunnels and you'll see one in one of the slides going under the highway. Uh, so I'm in the process, or not in the process, I've already done this and it's not showing up. We can stop there, that's good. I've actually, you can see the beginning of, of a bypass. Why don't you back off a little bit? We're, and we'll see this in a minute, but this is a, this is a road that I've gotten built that takes the place of this road that runs through the campus. This is the road to Guanope. And so that's been done. It's, and it, it's another one of those magical things. I did some time in a, a Department of Transportation, knew a little bit about roads, and most people thought you could never move it, but we did. And by giving the country the land to build on, the right of way through our campus, and then putting it out from the campus and then taking cars out so we could close, and we have been doing that, closing the roads in campus and pedestrianizing. That's part of the step toward uh, being a little bit more sustainable. I'm in the process of moving the Pan American Highway, believe it or not. And we've, we, this is designed to go up and around the campus, up in the agricultural area, coming down behind a lot of the built up area and back to the road. This is the bypass and we are presently working with President Hernandez and uh, in CEPE, which is the transportation agency for the country, to actually do that. And we're giving them the right of way, whether or not we have to pay a lot of money. It's a $5 million project which $5 million in Honduras goes a long, long way. And so that's another project you'll see, I think, in later slides. All right. Let's go to the first, first slide. Okay, there it is. This is an older, obviously, an older sepia slide. Uh, and what I want you to see in it is obviously back in the day, the Pan American Highway sort of went innocently through. This may have been paved now. This would have been in probably in the uh, probably in the 50s or 60s. Uh, the campus is here, the, the residential part of the campus and the academic part of the campus for some strange reason was on the other side of the road. It was fairly easy to cross, not a lot of traffic. And you can see, what you'll see is the campus keeps building and you can see the agricultural uh, orchards and planting that's being done on the campus uh, back, back then. This is the seed plant right in here, which is one of the largest repositories of heritage seeds in the, in the Americas. So the, the university is also a library of, of uh, original plants, if you can imagine that. This is a kind of the beginnings of pictures of some of the original, uh, I call it original town site, but this was a staff house. These are dormitories. This is the comedor, the, uh, the dining hall, the library. Uh, and I want you to see the Santa Inez Mountains, which are the mountains where we have just finished harvesting water off the mountains out of springs that are always there. We own the mountains. We own the mountains on both, all three sides of this Yawari Valley River. And what we're doing is we're gravity flowing the harvested water off the mountains through treatment plants. Everything is gravity flow, no pumps. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So dorms, it is basically the, the administrative building is down here in front. You'll see it, it's an iconic structure, Zamuri Hall, named after Samuel Zamuri, the CEO of United Fruit Company that founded it. The makeup of the students, I've talked about, you know, the idea that they're all in uniforms, real sophisticated uniforms, blue shirt, blue jeans. They do have dress uniforms, but they're all the same. They're issued by the university. Many people can't afford it. A lot of our students are quite poor. The, the uh, half of the students are on full scholarship. Another 25% are on uh, half scholarship and the rest are full pay. And what we're, we're, we're doing right now, if you think about it, the countries give certain number of scholarships. Panama will give 90 scholarships, then they'll change governments and they'll not give anything. And then Honduras changes governments and gives us 80. So we're constantly, every year, trying to deal with a piston engine that's going up and down to try to get enough for the, 
the uh, 1,280 students that are there in the university. We've just started a graduate program in tropical sustainable agriculture. You'll see a building that I'm constructing for that. Uh, 425 women, 855 hombres. Uh, bottom line, uh, it's, we're still in a sort of a macho uh, culture. Uh, women are beginning to become more and more the larger part of the student body. They were just permitted for the first time in the 80s, late 80s. Uh, the president's wife is in the first, was in the first graduating class of six women, four of which survived. She is tough as nails. You can imagine um, being one of six women in a, in a group that was probably about 800 men at the time. Uh, they're coming from 22 different countries. And then the makeup is there if you're really interested. You know, you can see some countries in this particular uh, cadre is, you know, you got a lot of students from one or two countries, and then some countries go down over periods of time. But they're colonies, co colonies of students, colonials of students from each country. It's like a fraternity of Peruvians, a fraternity of Guatemalans. It's quite uh, uh, water. We'll, we'll get into some of the initiatives. I would say that we are about 85% self-sufficient. Um, and that's, that's a number I can pull out of the sky and nobody can disprove it. Uh, so I speak like Donald Trump, that's it's 85%. It's, it's perfect. It's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And uh, Putin has written a letter backing it up as well. We're, we're, we're digging and dredging a series of lagoons, lagunas, and uh, to catch water. The climate change down there is interesting. We are on the dry side of Honduras. The North Shore and the Caribbean side up to the mountains is wet. Down the South side toward the Pacific is dry. It's similar throughout South, uh, Central America. So the rainy season is mostly afternoon storms from, it used to be from March to about September. Um, it's shrinking. The size of the season, the length of the season is shrinking. The, I th we think the water is about the same. It's just coming a little bit more violently surprise. And so it becomes even more critical for us to catch it the minute it falls and to store it in a growing number of lagunas that we are uh, digging in the middle of the, the fields. We own 8,000 or so acres of land, so we have room for that. And so everything we do, we'll, we'll get into it in a second, has to go into that lagoon because it becomes the uh, irrigation system for the, all the production of agriculture, animals, uh, vegetables, grains, forest products, and everything else. And uh, so we're, getting, we're, we're doing three more lagunas, and we have different parts of the campus that gravity flow to different lagoons, and those lagoons are used for different areas of, uh, of agriculture. So I flipped a, this is a little proposal we're doing. We're actually going to solar-powered uh, irrigation. Uh, and we'll talk about solar power under energy, but. The idea here is that you're irrigating during the day or early day. The sun is producing energy about the same time you're irrigating, so we're able to, I've just thrown one screen, you're probably needing three or four. But this is, this is a proposal that's going to USAID about uh, solar powered pumps. And it's just a symbolic kind of sketch. But uh, the bottom line is we're, we're installing, we're looking to install them. It's gonna be about a $500,000 uh, undertaking. Stop me, if you have a question, just raise your hand. Uh, this is the land that we own, uh, the main campus. Oops, sorry. The main campus, too many buttons. It is, here's, here's, the, here's the CA6, the trucks, they're working their way down the hill, and wham, and then they're going again up to Don Lee. Don Lee, incidentally, is the cigar capital of Honduras. The, it's alleged that that country is the second best producer of cigars, and it's about 35 kilometers away. Uari River is running this way. This is the Santa Ynez mountain that we're mining for uh, water. This is the Uyuca where we're mining. We have an option to eventually mine off of this particular mountain. There's a bunch of villages, Hikarito, which is about 10,000 people. We've actually had a studio from CED, uh, the MEPD program, a few years ago before the Office of International Affairs said that you could get killed down there and stopped uh, the, the idea that we could even bring students there. I go there, they apparently don't care if I get killed or not. <laughs> uh, so so we're, doing a, we're, doing a number of, we're doing a number of things. So this is the big picture of the, what we call the mining of water. And the, the water is coming from this mountain, it's all gravity flow until you get to about here and it starts going uphill. 
You all know that if water originates at a point higher than this point, it will push itself to that point. And that's, uh, that's, that's your hydrologic engineering class for the semester. This is all straight gravity flow. Part of what we do is we also allow Hikarito to share in some of the mined water that we have. We even treat it for them. Uh, and it's been a huge improvement and we're working with them to get sewage into their city because the city just drops all their wastewater into the El Gallo Creek and we're looking at using that for irrigation. So we're actually looking, and I'll show you in a minute, how to divert that polluted creek into a series of wetlands, uh, constructed wetlands with aquatic benches and, and filters, all again gravity flow and treating it so that it gets to a point where we can use it for irrigation. So we're not letting anything get through without bringing it up to at least an irrigatable uh, standard. Uh, let's see, any other? The other thing we're doing is uh, as the valley grows, we're not that far from Tegucigalpa. Every time I go there, it looks like Tegucigalpa has grown another couple inches, you know, in the big map. You're growing over the hill, they grow uh, Christmas flowers at certain elevations, there are a lot of flower uh, exports going on on that mountain, Yuyuka. But the city is growing more and more toward us. The city is not a very particularly pleasant place to live, so those that can afford to live elsewhere, suburban, are beginning to push in our direction. They have an interesting transit system on CA6, very effective. All the buses that we condemn go down there, they shine them up, hang a lot of interesting stuff in the windows, and every 15 or 20 minutes, there's one going down the road on its way to Tegucigalpa or coming back. So the, the frequency and the reliance of those buses coming and going in terms of headway are far better than American standards, largely because nobody has cars. Uh, motorcycles are beginning to, to be uh, present, but the, the ownership of automobiles is next to nothing. So uh, the traffic that's on CA6 is traffic moving from Tegucigalpa to Managua or some of the larger cities along the way. Uh, we're also studying reservoirs on land that we own. We don't own this, but these are two places we've identified be because the best way we can protect the harvest of our water for our system is to continue to help the surrounding communities have water that's reliable for them. Obviously the risk is if you're the only one with potable water, then it's gonna get nationalized. That's always a risk. So we've got two reservoir sites. There is a, a European Union grant that looks to, to help develop. We do the same thing as USAID. There's other countries, Japan in particular, Korea, that uh, contribute a lot of money to Central and South America and as their, as their uh, foreign aid. And so there's grants to build those reservoirs and we're competing for them. This particular one is on, mostly on our property. There's a canyon right in here that most of the reservoir would be right in here. And this is land that's pretty remote to us and probably not particularly usable or accessible. The Ferrari property, not the car. It's the name of a farmer. <laughs> this is a, 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 the, our treatment. This is a recently installed uh, water pipe going from Santa Inez to this treatment plant. So the harvest on Santa Inez goes downhill, and then in here it starts climbing. But the treatment plant is below the elevation of the, of the pond that we've, the dam that we've made up on the creek in the mountain and therefore it pushes itself all the way to that plant. And then obviously the stuff coming off of Yucca is just downhill. This is designed by Cornell. Uh, it's called Agua Clara. It's absolutely gravity flow. There's no, it treats it only with chlorine, which is added to the water. We filter, filtrate it. It's sediment tanks and things like that to take other things out of it. It is potable. I have been there for 17 years and I have never visited Montezuma. So and obviously this is just built, so we've had other systems to kind of bypass that. Beer is always a safe bet down there, bottled beer. So, and then we have uh, uh, storage tanks, 100,000, uh, four, four 100,000 gallon storage tanks. So we treat the water, it flows in off the mountains. It, uh, the mountains have two different types of water. There's the mineral contents of the mountain, make the water and we mix it. So uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, Basically, well, here's the storage tanks right in here. That's the campus. And bottom line is, when those tanks fill up, the water is always flowing. When the tanks fill up, there's a little flap valve. We don't treat the water for potable water supply anymore. We don't waste the, the only the single chlorine chemical that we put in it. And the valve closes, and the water passes on down to the lagoons. 
So it's just mount, water mountain, mountain water coming off, passing the plant, and going to the lagoons. And we're building more and more lagoons because the rainy season is getting shorter and shorter. Uh, so again, it's an example of the transmission lines, example of the kind of the set of the valley, and this is the plant, uh, and it's got a class for a minute. Part of the training for the students, the education for the students, the experiential learning, it's one of the learning by doing modules is about harvesting and treating water. Cornell is actually, this is the biggest plant they put up. They're building uh, smaller package plants that, and using the exact same principles that they can export to other developing nations. And the students that are graduating there will be in those developing nations and using that technology. So they're learning it there and there's classrooms there. It's not, a, it's not rocket science, quite simple. And again, uh, we also build a building so we don't have air conditioning and we don't have heating. Uh, it's fans on a real hot day. March is the hottest part of the year. And that's very rarely have I ever been in a room at the hotel that we built, uh, ever had the air conditioner on. Uh, you just open the windows and you have a fan if it gets bad. So, and, and bad is 88 degrees. So, uh, this is the Runnel system. The Runnel system was built for, uh, for irrigation back in the 40s. It was a gravity flow irrigation system and these are Runnels. And these are existing historic runnels. I guess we could put them on the National Register for Historic Places. They also played with it. Uh, these are between two classrooms and the runnels come in and they splash and bubble and whatever they do. Uh, but then again, they're on their way down to the agricultural fields which are below the campus. Um, I'm building more runnels. Every building we build, we don't, you, you can see that this is the typical building. This is the stone we use and we use a, uh, a clay tile roof those clay tiles used to come from Honduras, very short distance. Stone comes from about three kilometers out. The uh, tile comes from, used to come from Tegucigalpa, about 45 kilometers. Then we discovered that they don't fire them heavy enough or long enough, so they're not uh, really well-fired tiles, so we're not actually importing them from Spain, something we need to work with. But that can be solved by having a better furnace uh, somewhere in, in Honduras. And given the number of tiles that you'll see on roofs everywhere you look, you would think somebody is going to come up with a, with a fire that's good enough to cook. Basically, the softer tiles, they, they grow mosses and things, and they, they come apart. Uh, you can't repair the roof very easy. It's hard to walk on the roof. Uh, the, the, it absorbs more water during a rainstorm. It's heavier. The roof structure has to be bigger. So uh, we're, we're, that's the bad thing we're doing right now is exporting the coming in big sea containers um, from Spain. Uh, so this is an example of the typical swales that we're building uh, 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 just below the roofs. You can see in this case, this is an old building, but they've actually, all this is that stone, the same stone that's just put on the ground and just below the, uh, the roof line and therefore the, the water in this case just kind of falls into this channel or some of it might be absorbed in that lawn. We're trying to get rid of all the lawn that we're now walking on too, going to an absolute natural zero scaping system and so the, that's another thing that we're doing on the campus. So what you see is the lagoons that we're digging and there's, these are all built and we probably are going to put another one in the series here. It, the bottom line is how much water can we catch, how can we uh, store it for the roughly for about four months and then get into the growth period. Incidentally the shortening of the rainy season allows us to have two seasons of growing. That's another thing that's happening. It's, rainy season is not a good time to grow. The sun's not out there and it's, it gets too wet. Uh, so this is the collection system. So this is kind of symbolic of the runnels that we're developing. Uh, this is uh, waste remediation. Right now, all, everything on the campus, just like the lagoons, is collected in pipes, the sewer system. Uh, all the faculty live on the campus, staff lives on the campus. Uh, I have eight more houses to build and everybody will be on the campus. We won't pay any off-campus uh, uh, monies. We're actually taking that money that we pay someone to live off campus and putting together to build the houses that we uh, need to put them on campus. Uh, the old system, the old runnel system, this is the El Gallo stream, the old runnel system had a diversion weir in it and it went out in Hurricane Mitch, a giant hurricane that hit Central America about 15, 20 years ago, maybe more than that, and wrecked a lot of things. We're, re we're rebuilding them and again it's just a diverter to push, it, to push the stream if we can treat it into the runnel system. That's another place where we can be harvesting. But otherwise, 
Right now, the sewage system goes, the, the on-campus sewage system goes through a series of three ponds, and the students learn how to test the water. They learn how to do the, what we call a uh, very, very rudimentary type of wastewater treatment. We don't actually do anything. We're looking at putting a, a purifier, or not a purifier, a, pure, a purier treatment one in, at, at this point where we can actually filter it out. And we're probably putting another pond in and we're building some aquatic benches that are not in the ponds yet. So we're upgrading those to a better uh, aquatic system that'll uh, do, you know, bioremediation. Uh, and this is the system that we're building right there. It's all gravity flow. This is where we're looking at diverting the El Gallo Creek through the diverter into a series of uh, aquatic wetlands so that we can actually, in different kinds of crops, take pollutants up differently. So uh, some of the orchards, if you ever get into, agri and I'm not an expert on it, but we, get, we hire somebody that is. Um, basically, if you're using orchards, uh, you're irrigating orchards with the less than perfectly treated water, then it's, it's not taken into the, uh, uh, the mangoes that you're growing. If you're growing uh, carrots underneath, radishes and things like that, it might take it up a little bit more directly. So again, there's a strategy of what you plant for that particular, and this is just another system and, it's, uh, and we, have other, we have own a lot of land where we can actually do a different kind of agriculture. Energy. Uh, we built a one megawatt plant. We borrowed, we pay roughly uh, $800,000 a year in electricity from NE, which is the, uh, which is the monopoly, the national monopoly. Um, we don't think that batteries are good enough yet uh, they're, they're, they're very expensive and they're not particularly reliable, so the technology in batteries is getting better. We're not getting into that yet, so we're dependent totally on produce and consume. And so this represents one third of our need. And basically, an E will not allow us to have reversible meters, so we don't get any credit for things that we overproduce. So basically, you have a typical you know, the sun comes up, the sun goes down, and the, your production, and that's just a, me pulling a magic marker out of my back pocket. It's not a highly sophisticated thing that you want to take a picture of and then send to your local engineers. But basically, symbolically, this is what our production is. This is what our diurnal daily consumption patterns are. Obviously, they go down at night, but there's still lots of things going on. So that field is producing this. And it's a fixed solar system. We are now getting ready to install trackers, which are much more efficient at producing even at, at this part of it. And we're going to produce a little bit more at the top. We're losing that into the system. We are negotiating with the NE to give us credit for what we're dumping into the system. They're not inclined. They, they appreciate it, and they can make money, and they'll leave it at that. We're not there yet. So we have, obviously, we have to have backup generators. We consume, I, I don't know how many uh, board me meetings I go to, and then in the middle of the board meeting, the lights go out. That's pretty classical, pretty typical. So that's part of the experience. It's just in the middle of a sentence or in the middle of one of your presentations, boom, it disappears. And then you just sit there and say, okay, and then you discuss something that you don't need technology for in the dark. And then it comes on five, ten minutes later. So backups are obviously for the computer system that can't really stand doing that. So we have those that kick in immediately. They are diesel powered. We're trying to assume that we can power them directly off the solar system. We're not sure that it won't work at night, obviously, when the grid goes down. So bottom line is, you know, you have your net metering. That doesn't work yet. Battery technology. We're also using solar hot water heaters on everything. Those are really efficient. And uh, we've installed them on all the new buildings, and we're going back and retro and fitting most of the old buildings with them. So uh, if you get batteries, then you can afford to take this puppy and fatten it up, really fatten it up. And what we've done, it, it, it cost a million dollars to build. So we borrowed from our own foundation, and the $200,000 a year we save on energy because we're producing it ourselves is automatically, the board has decided that we're financing our own solar system, our solar panel uh, production that goes back into the foundation on, on an annual basis. That field has already paid itself off three years faster than we thought. So basically, the money that you typically save, even though we're growing and consuming more, is the money that goes right back into the foundation. So it's financial sustainability. That's another aspect of sustainability. 
I, I get into arguments with myself all the time. Uh, is this, are we shooting for sustainability or are we shooting for net zero? I just throw that up as a thought. You know, you're always going to have plastic toothbrushes. You're always going to have maybe the batteries are not going to be particularly sustainable in terms of production and then reuse or re recycling. There's lots of things you do that are going to be really difficult to cause complete sustainability. So what you do is you overproduce in one area and you still underproduce in another and you add them up and you're at zero. So net zero is kind of the principle that I kind of believe in. I probably should have retitled it uh, net zero in Honduras. But uh, we we're producing net zero homes in the United States now. A friend of mine has won a couple national awards for producing them, one at Serenby, as a matter of fact, near Atlanta. So I just throw that up just to make you think at least. All of our structures, this is a, this is a non-denominational cha chapel. Someone said, well then what's that? But basically all the religions have a closet and they bring their stuff out and then you have uh, some, something going on. Uh, the windows, I might add, are pictures of tractors and fields. Ain't no saints in the windows. It's just tractors and st it's, an, it's the agriculture which is the base for the whole the culture of the place. But I, I show this only because, and this is where they have singing and lots of other things, production with a, with a roof on it. But the idea is it's all open. It's very comfortable, it's shady. I've never been in there and been uncomfortable. There are fans, you can turn them on. But again, part of what this is all about is not consuming energy to heat or cool yourself. And obviously there's an advantage to being in that location. It's tropical. Uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, spend, I've, I've been designing stuff for 17 years. This is an example of a, a, a new urbanist subdivision, or an old neo-traditional subdivision, I wouldn't say. And, and basically, whoops, basically, uh, there's, this is the front doors of everything. This is the back door, and this is where the, it, the faculty do bring cars. And uh, there, there's, uh, this is basically built to house uh, the growth. We're actually building these two units right now for, for staff. And that's part of the business of bringing everybody into the campus. So you'll see a construction. And basically we did a, a study on solar panel, hot water, uh, what we call small houses. They're not tiny homes. They're uh, 800 square feet. Pretty comfortable. A uh, little study in them. Uh, uh, two bedrooms. So it allows your faculty or staff to bring children. We have teachers that come from Europe and the United States. So the idea is you give them a place to live and that's part of the attraction for them to come. We also have a uh, elementary school, middle school, and high school. We just finished building the high school. It's SACS accredited, the same accreditation body for the University of Georgia. Uh, it's a spectacular school. It's known as one of the best in the country. It's built as an attraction for people to come and teach. Obviously, we bring your family, you bring your students. Uh, obviously, if you think about U.S. bases overseas, there's always a school on the base. So in this case, the faculty and staff have the children in there. There's a, there's a tuition. Uh, they're, they're uniformed. Uh, they're fed so that you're going to have poor and rich because when the faculty and staff don't fill the school, which is the usual case, the, the rest of the seats are open to the kids in the nearby villages. And so they're coming in, usually at, we're looking for really bright people and they're, they're poor as hell. And so what you do is you have to make it so that they don't stand out as poor people. The people on the campus are probably pretty, well not probably, they are very fortunate relative to the surrounding countryside. So we're building these and they are built, uh, we're trying using a saw on the stone, it's another way of speeding up production, but uh, these houses are built that way. Uh, these are typical faculty houses built a long time ago. This was the <coughs> founder's house. It, it's now a kind of a place where uh, muckety mucks get to stay. Um, it's uh, called uh, Casa Popano, which is the founder, the person that actually was the first rector of the school, the president. This is a typical faculty house. Uh, we're not going to build them that big anymore. We have plenty of ones that size. We think they're a little bit overbuilt, but they don't have heating and cooling. I don't think they, any of them do, not that I've spotted, and we're putting hot water heaters on all of them. This we just reconditioned, just finished. That's the other thing we did when I, we got there. They were not maintaining anything, so there was deferred maintenance and everything. So we, I started a, about 12 to 15 years ago 
a major maintenance program where we were actually replacing all the roofs. And we're actually putting steel trusses in them so the, uh, they can't be eaten by termites, big thing down there, and with a deck that has a little zinc uh, layer on it underneath the tile. So they're pretty much a little more resilient against the little critters that like to take houses down pretty commonly. So uh, we still have the, the eaves are still using wood and, and the verticals are, are wood. So we kept everything traditional but we're actually quietly putting stuff in that makes things last a lot longer. And incidentally, the tile, the high, the high fired towel, tire, tile, <laughs> whatever, if you tires on the roof, tiles on the roof, the high fired tiles last a lot longer too. That's, so it may be worth importing them until someone gets smart enough to open a plant. Uh, this, is a, this is a shot I took just outside my room. This is my hotel room. And it's Chef Lara's. Yeah, how much money do you pay for Chef Lara? They're growing like, weeds down there. <laughs> you'd, uh, you'd love uh, to have those hanging in the halls here, but they grow all over the place. And again, uh, it's, the plant material is our fabulous and we're beginning to replace lawns. This is a case where we've got a, a local plant that's instead of the grass, so you know, we're getting better. That's, we got a long way to go there. But the idea here is that the hallway in the hotel is open. The rooms are open. Uh, you, you have screens. You do have a wooden uh, uh, shutters that you can close to make it dark, but other than that, that's that's your that's your energy system in those those buildings. <coughs> These are under construction. Uh, I just took the shots in November. I was down there. This is the beginning of uh, this is a it's kind of like a duplex. It's basically a unit and another unit with a two parking spaces in between it. So we're standing in the driveway that's going to be between this unit and this unit. And so uh, and we have another unit, under, another pair under construction right here. This is the new dormitory for uh, the graduate program. And instead of putting two kids in a, in a room like we have undergraduate, incidentally, there's no hot water in the dorms. The tradition there is a cold shower. I have been trying to put hot water in, uh, at least hot water pipes in the dorm because I know it's gonna change at some point and cost us a lot of money to retrofit. Uh, I have been told by the people on the board uh, that are graduates of the place, hell no. And so I do have hot water pipes in this one on the guise that it's a graduate dorm. And if you're attracting graduate students, they're not about to do that. Graduate students in this room would not take cold showers and go to a kind of a university like that. So this is the dorm, it'll have uh, 25 beds, and it'll have a little kitchen, laundry, and things like that. Incidentally, the students are issued the uniforms, that's the other thing we do, and we have a lavanderia, or laundry, uh, that actually does their laundry for them. They bring their bags over and, it's, and they take their bags back. So all that kind of service, they, we feed them, we uh, clothe them, and we shelter them, and we teach them, uh, both in academically and applied academics in the field. Uh, the other thing to make things a little bit more net zero or sustainable, whatever you want to call it, is we've been trying to fight the idea of students on the weekend going to Tegucigalpa and, have, and partying, we actually take them on a bus because it's less risky for them to take our bus to go there and then we pick them up. We drop them off at the International, Intercontinental Hotel and uh, they take up a floor and apparently leave most of the furniture broken by the end of the weekend. So we're doing more and more on campus to make the campus a lot more attractive to the students. So basically, the, this is typically, this is a kiosk that I drew a, a diagram of it, I didn't show it here, but uh, then we got a contributor, $30,000, and we built it. And we got about four or five of them around campus. They're really neat social spaces. They have a, two little cookers and a sink, and that turns into the big social space the minute they have any time to get together. And these are built right next to the dorms. This is uh, part of an orchidarium. It's the National Flower of Honduras' orchids. A national flower of every country in Central America, I believe, is orchid of some sort. We got a big contributor. The board didn't want me to build this. They said that it's not in our core, uh, our core direction of the university. I said, well, you want to send the money back to the donor? No. So we, I toned it down a little bit. This is a kit. This is a, a, rain, a cloud forest uh, orchidarium, and the kit hasn't come from the U.S. at this time, so the base is built, but the glass and the humidifiers and all that sort of thing that uh, caters to that particular orchid environment hasn't been in. The rest of them are uh, um, dry, uh, dry and tropical, and uh, they could just be open nets. 
So we have an orchidarium, we have arboretums, they're places where people study, learn plant materials, just like landscape architects. This is an old building that we are retrofitting uh, to a, a gym. We have a swimming pool and another gym elsewhere on the campus. We have net, the soccer fields that are open. We have soccer fields and nets. We have baseball fields. Uh, we're building a couple of handball courts, tennis. We have uh, horseback riding. So we're, we're building all of that stuff to make the campus self-contained and attractive. We can't make a student stay there Saturday afternoon and Sunday when they're off, but we can attract them not to opt for the alternative. Uh, we're doing master planning all over the place. When I started on the campus, we, uh, we started with no dorms here, and we've built nine of them. I don't, that doesn't come out to nine. That's that little old building. It used to be a poultry building that we are re retrofitting to, uh, to a uh, gymnasium. We're looking at another cafeteria. The other cafeteria is overloaded. And the other thing I'm looking at, this is the hotel you'll see in a minute. That we're looking to add on to it um, and then build a typical South American Central Park, little plaza. And then on the other side, taking all of the retail we have on the campus, we have stores and other things, other retail, pushing it off the campus so it can be used by the village. You can't, the villagers can't get into the campus. So it's high security. And so we're building it out here and that's probably where we could put the kind of entertainment that the students might be attracted to that's just outside the door of the campus. So we're trying, again, this will be a retail village and we've got a sponsor that wants to build a village. And then what he'll do is he'll own it and operate it until he pays it off. It's uh, Fernando Pice, who used to own uh, Hyper Pice stores throughout Central and South America, who recently sold it all to Walmart. So he has the capital to do it. And he was a former board member, so he's going to do it. He's going to, uh, we're going to rent it. He's going to rent it out, make a living out of it. And as soon as it's paid off, he'll dedicate it to the university. Again, it's another strategy. This shows you the Hicarito, the town up here. Uh, this, is the, this is where the CA6 comes. It's going to then bypass this way. You can see where it avoids the center of the campus. Uh, it's already, the Guanope bypass is already built, which got rid of this. And, we, and when we build this, we're going to shut down North Villages comes down to t through the campus as well. And so does Hicarito. These two roads get closed and we will then have no public roads transecting the campus. Um, and this, this is our plan to, to do it. So when we build, we want to vacate that when, when uh, we build the road. We're going, to tan we're going to tar and develop the road, pave it into Hicarito. Our, our water plant is here and the road is so dusty that it, we're worried about the plant. So we're paving the road on the, under the guys we're helping the city, but it's really to kind of keep the dust out of the water plant. But the city has agreed to vacate this street. And then when we take the next element of the North Bypass and connect to the North Villages, they vacate this. So now we're, we're done. There's some of your transportation. This is an example of the, pass the passageways that go under CA6. They're all throughout the campus. They're kind of cool. Uh, they're interesting. You'll hear frogs in the drainage underneath the street. Uh, underneath the, the, there's drain ways. Obviously, this water will collect if we don't drain it out. These are your transportation devices, tuk-tuks. Uh, you can go up to Hikarito from the campus for about five limpiras, which there are 25 limpiras to a dollar, so five limpiras is not a much. It's a pretty inexpensive. Um, there's, they're beginning to be corrupted a little bit, uh, people controlling who owns them. This is an interesting, and I shot this. Uh, the opening slide was up on the, uh, on the mountain where the quarry is. This fellow has a full-blown smith, uh, smithing operation going. He's got a little oven and the little billows, and he's cooking the uh, rebar, uh, this rebar, and as you can see it, and he's flattening the ends so that they turn into the, the, the chisels that you're carving the stone. The stone is spectacular because it's got a rough edge, but it's pretty accurate, and they're not all perfectly the same size. The width is the same. They're pretty careful there, but the lengths are a little bit varying. And when we build buildings, we have to put a miscellaneous metal in the structure if we're going to do two-story. These would normally be load-bearing walls, but I don't trust that, so we put a metal frame in, and then basically we just carve the stone around the metal, and you never, you, it's built into the wall. You never see it. It's pretty cool. But he's, uh, this is uh, the quarry, and it's that primitive. 
That's, that's the shot of him again. That's me standing there holding one of the stones. It's fairly light. Uh, this little story is quick. Uh, Kellogg came down to celebrate 30 years after they built our Central Kellogg, which is our hotel for continuing education, just like we have here, except they took the name off. Then they came around to celebrate 30 years. We still had the name on. The woman came in and said, we're going to give you new furniture and linens and FF&E, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, and we're going to uh, you know, do this for you. And I said, well, the roof leaks. We really need more help than that. Two weeks later, she sent us half of a $2.17 million grant to build, uh, put hot water heaters, put up a whole new roof, and build this extension of the hotel. Two weeks after, we talked about how we needed a little more help. And again, uh, they came down uh, to celebrate the opening of it. This is just at the end, toward the end of construction. Uh, we, we basically celebrated with them. They gave us another $10 million for Haitian scholarships. Uh, because they were lo losing their money investing in the country directly. So things are nice. We did a sketch and gave it to her. And she's real happy. She's the president of the Kellogg Foundation. We're building a coffee center. What's happening in the world is coffee is now being mechanically harvested in Brazil and Vietnam. Um, coffee that we're going to be teaching the students how to manage and grow is grown throughout Central and South America. And it's becoming niche coffee. Uh, your generation doesn't like the bitter coffee, apparently. You're looking for a sweeter coffee. We're, they're studying, they're, uh, I just came back from Panama, a large coffee grower, and what they're doing is they're drying the beans with a pulp on them, and the pulp, the bean is now absorbing the sugars from the pulp, and it's getting a sweeter coffee. The other big market is the Asian market that's coming hopefully off of tea and into coffee. So if the coffee is a little bit sweeter, a little less bitter, so they're, they're, what, this coffee center is a $2 million building that uh, Nestle and a couple of other corporations are gonna build because they want to train the students at the university who go back to Co Colombia and go with Juan Valdez. Uh, <laughs> Lulu, does Juan Valdez live in Colombia? <laughs> but they're going back to their countries and they're going to be operating uh, coffee plantations and farms for niche coffees. They're not going to compete with the mechanically harvested coffee in Vietnam and Brazil and other places. So it's really a rapidly growing market. So this is again an example of a of a plan that I'm doing and it's now being given to donors and the donors are beginning to, we're about halfway I think there and then we're going to try to get a $1 million endowment to fund the people who operate the coffee center. So again, financially it's a sustainable operation. The board requires a financial plan for everything that comes onto the campus. And then uh, just as we're getting close to the end, we're we running over probably. Um, and we should. Uh, meat, fish, dairy, and eggs, they produce a lot of their own food. So the example of dairy is they learn how to do herd management, breeding, managing the herds, harvesting. We have the top of the line uh, milking parlors on the campus. They're, they're, they learn how to do that. We also have parlor, parlors that are dem demonstrative of developing country opportunities. So there's a, there's a kind of a milking system that can be done in a country that can't afford the top end uh, milking parlor. So we have those. Uh, we process the milk. We make our own uh, uh, milk that's vacuum packed for non-refrigerated areas. Uh, milk that can be put in refrigeration. Well, uh, ice cream, yogurt, cheese, butter, all produced in our dairy plant. It's a full-blown dairy plant. Again, you can imagine the student when he first starts out, he she f starts, f first starts out shoveling crap from behind the cow and when working their way up as they become seniors to marketing and actually marketing, packaging, and producing the product. So it's what we would call a, a vertical consolidation. We take it all the way from the very beginning all the way to the marketing end. Then we sell to Walmart and Colonial uh, Markets and, uh, and anything is surplus over what we consume. And we have our own store with our own products and we have our own brand. So you can see that thing goes to consumption and off. So there's a little fundraising going on. There's some funding. And basically what that does is it supports that industry. It doesn't make a lot of profit. It just basically supports the, the learning by doing modules that are in that particular line. And then you have beef. Uh, we have breeding, managing herds. Uh, we have bio digesters for pork, uh, which is in here as well. Um, harvesting. We have, a, we have a meat packing plant. I'm about to say a butcher, butchering, butchering plant, meat packing, I think. And that was given to us by Cargill. 
and it's, uh, it's got everything that's uh, modern, and so the students learn everything all the way to marketing, beef products and consuming, beef and pork. Poultry, the same thing. We have uh, laying hens, and we've got uh, meat hens. And again, the same process. You can trace it all the way through for eggs off here, and then harvesting chickens and whatever. And in aquaculture, the, you saw the kids wading during that clip, wading in the water. Uh, tilapia, huge production of tilapia. We, we grow the fingerlings that are sell, sold to other places in, in the Central America and South America. And we also produce the fish, and we consume it and market the fish. Not a lot. We barely, uh, that's, that's a, not a, prof, a huge profit thing, so we take it all the way so the student at least understands how fishes, fish are harvested and packaged and all that. Other stuff, we'll get right close to the end here. And I, I just didn't want to draw slides for the rest of my life. Uh, we, we have juices that are coming out of all the tropical fruits that are around. Mangoes are all over the place. And if you don't get them right when they hit the ground or at the top of your head, uh, they're gone. The, the bees consume them rather rapidly. So we have fruits and vegetables. We have a post-harvest plant. It's a plant that processes the, uh, the fruits and vegetables. And we sell them and we consume them just as the other you know, consumption, Walmart, Price Mart, uh, down there. Price Mart is uh, about to, uh, we're hitting on them to give a large donation to expand the post-harvest plant. Uh, we have a, obviously, we want to uh, have pollinators all over this agricultural land, so we have a very large bee uh, population, uh, and we have honey processing. That's a little bit rudimentary. They're, they harvest it, and you'll see them pouring it into jars and then putting hand labels on them and capping them, but they, it's, we haven't, coffee is about to get a lot larger. We have uh, forest management, forest products. We have horticulture. Uh, the forest product, you know, the forest management is planting trees, managing trees, and all these mountains that we own, which are reserves, and we harvest. So we have for, we have a sawmill, and uh, we they, they learn how to plant, how to manage the forest, how to thin it, how to uh, harvest it, how to saw it, even how to a lot of the furniture on campus is made in that that uh, operation. Um, uh, horticulture is here. Uh, we have a large horticulture area, and we actually sell stuff out uh, to the villages and everything. Um, uh, we have, uh, this is kind of interesting. One of the big things in developing countries is people going out in the woods and cutting trees down to cook, and it's pretty necessary. So what can you do to stop them from doing that? And most of it's our forests in the area. We developed very high efficiency stoves that have been invented by people on the campus and studied. And it was so successful that we got large grants to mass produce them and give them to people so that they cook the stew, the, their, do their cooking in a much more restricted place where you get a higher heat and not quite as much product having to be burned. And then everybody else started sending their stoves to us to get uh, our, what we call underwriters laboratory certifications. So we have a stove operation that actually rates stoves coming in and we, we give them a rating. And then they go, they use that as kind of like your UL rating on your refrigerator. So I think uh, that's, uh, the cool thing about this is the other, the faculty doesn't have a faculty club and, and this is where we do receptions and everything. Now you come into the hotel, there's booking in here, you don't kind of wander through the building. So it's a lot more secure. It's just a cool thing. It's a, we have to be careful that the things we're doing don't look so good relative to the poorness around us. We're already seen as a bunch of elite slobs some in some cases when people are protesting to get, some, get something from us. We're always dedicating land. We're always going out and surveying the edge of our property against invasion and, uh, you know, squatting. And, and, and the board does not want to kick someone off that's been out there somewhere, so we end up negotiating a sale. I'm developing a strategy where all the edges of our property that are near where they can be reached off of a road, we're actually coming up with a platted row of lots that we sell off so that that becomes the boundary. Again, you know, you got eight or 9,000 acres, they call hectares down there, and hectares about a little over two, two plus acres. It's, a, it's 100 yards by 100 yards um, versus 2.8, 208 foot, six inches. Bottom line is we're even, the, even the protection of the land is a strategy. And we have to do it very carefully. Otherwise, uh, a country like that can also get up in arms very quickly and they can nationalize lots of things. They can interfere. Although the president, who's been reelected against the Constitution, is very friendly to the university. So it's one of those things, God, he's going to help us 
relocate the CA-6, which is huge, so we're kind of hoping he hangs on long enough to get the road built, and then he can pay attention to the Constitution, get arrested, and sent to jail. Uh, so I'll stop there uh, on, that, on that high note. And uh, we'll probably run over a little bit. I'd, I'll be happy to take any questions from anybody. But this has been a blast. I have learned more. I was on a panel somewhere in, I can't remember where it was, Boston. And we were all sitting there, highfalutin folks. And I was the last. And everyone was saying, we have got to take our knowledge of sustainability and export it to developing countries. And I was last. And I went, no. We got to go to, and I'd already been here for 10 years. We got to go to the developing countries to learn how they are sustainable out of absolute necessity. And they're far ahead of us. And some of the simple things that they do that I've learned to do there, and I didn't, I didn't come up with the solutions. I learned it from somebody in a village. Uh, we're, we're looking at a, a Howard Buffett grant of $34 million to set up uh, permaculture teaching. And, and we're assuming that a lot of these people are going back to small countries, small farms that are off the grid. And we're going to set up a system where we teach them how to do, do conservation, agriculture, permaculture, whatever you want to call it. But this kind of things that small farms effectively producing enough to help the family that runs it and maybe do a little bit of local export and trade. So I've learned more down there probably than I have in this fine institution. So it's been fun, and I'm going to keep on doing it until they, they bury me.